<clears throat> so I, I'm just going to introduce um, our, our first keynote speaker. Kelsey Patrick Faree is an attorney who has been working in the area of privacy and data breach law for 10 years. She's a member of the International Association of Privacy Professionals. She assists with companies with compliance with and with responses to data privacy issues. She holds a BA from the University of Iowa and a Juris Doctorate from Duke University School of Law. Her virtual practice is based in Iowa City. Kelsey? Uh, and if you have questions, I've got a microphone, so give a shout out. Good morning. <laughs> wow, can everybody hear me okay? All right, excellent. So. I am a lawyer and I am talking about data breaches today. So what am I doing at a cybersecurity conference? Well, I was talking to Greg and he asked me to come in and talk and I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, well, we get so little legal advice. Just talk about whatever you want to. And I said, oh my gosh, that's terrible. Um, so I'm just gonna go with something really basic today, which is what do you do after you have a data breach? You really need to have a methodical solution. So just a couple of disclaimers. I am not talking about the technology side. That's what you guys do. That's what you're here to learn about later today. Um, I'm going to address some of this stuff from a legal perspective, which is what you do, not how you do it. Uh, but what I'm doing here is not legal advice. You need to have specific advice that's specific to your organization and your situation. I'm just giving you some basic information. Um, I am not going to be focusing on regulated industries. The rules for regulated industries are different. I'm talking about non-regulated industries and I'm talking about companies that are only holding domestic information. Um, a lot of that stuff adds a lot of complicating factors, the regulated industries and the international elements. So I have a pretty narrow focus, but I hope that you will find this information helpful within that narrow focus. And the last thing is, um, if you have questions, feel free to jump in anytime. Greg's got the mic so that everyone in the room can hear you, so just raise your hand and he'll come over and find you. So. Um, we'll start out with the scope of the data breach problem. This is stuff that probably most of you are already aware of, but just to put this in perspective, um, we have had an increasing number of data breaches over time. Those were the years I could find information for. So 2012, we had 447. 2013, 614. 2014, 783. Um, in all, since 2005, there have been about 5,400 data breaches and more than 910 million individual records have been breached. Um, so these numbers are only the ones we know about. These are the ones that have been discovered and then made public. Um, there's a, if you look at the bottom there, there's privacyrights.org. It's a privacy rights clearinghouse. This is where you can find this information. It's got a lot of interesting stuff on it and links to the publicly released um, statements from companies that have had data breaches. Um, it is axiomatic in the industry at this point that it is not a matter of if, it is a matter of when your company will experience a data breach. If you Google search for it's not if, it's when data breach, you get almost three million hits. Um, now, a lot of people think that this is a problem that's unique to large businesses. Can I get a show of hands for how many people in the room work for companies with fewer than 50 employees? We got a handful. How about between 50 and, let's say, 300 employees? Good number of those, too. More than that? And students. Hi, guys. All right, so this is not a problem that is unique to large companies. I'm showing here a slide that talks about data breaches by, for large companies and data breaches for small companies that I found on that Privacy Rights Clearinghouse website. Um, some of the ones in the left-hand column you've probably all heard of. Uh, Neiman Marcus had problems twice in the last few years. Um, Target, Michaels, Neiman Marcus, P.F. Chang's, and the Home Depot and Staples are all in one bullet point there because they were all um, 
subject to the same breach. It was a Russian hacking group. There were millions and millions of records lost by these large companies. Do we have anyone in the room who got to work on that particular? No? Nobody will admit it? Oh, hey. <laughs> that was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Getting to deal with you know, basically state actors as your... Three of those. Three of them, oof, okay. <laughs> um, so then these other companies that you've heard of that have a lot of resources and have things that they, in place to deal with this stuff. AT&T, this actually is a good way to show some of the variety of things that happen. We just had Russian hackers. AT&T had a single employee access 1,600 records illegally that included social security numbers. And this happened in October of 2014. Um, the most recent ones that are on here are the IRS. This is an ongoing thing. You've probably seen it in the headlines that 100,000 people's records were breached via the FAFSA interface. And Arby's, which just announced that it lost 335,000 credit cards. Um, then we're gonna look at these small companies. In general, with small companies, the problem is the third party processors. Um, because small companies tend not to have the internal resources to do things like processing their credit card payments. Um, the one I'm going to look at first is this Westlake Touchless Car Wash. This is a single location car wash in California that had to make a public announcement about the fact that it lost the records of everybody who visited their car wash during a particular week. And then I was looking through the privacy rights clearinghouse records and I saw this ridiculously large number of car washes had to announce a breach around the same time and all of them said something about their third party payment processor having a breach. This is a point that I'm gonna bring up more than once during this presentation and that is that um, even though the data holder may be the one who has to make the announcement about the breach, you can transfer that obligation by contract. And that seems to me what must have happened here, that all of these car washes were using the same third-party payment processor who had somewhere in its contract that nobody ever reads, they just click OK and they move on with their day, um, that if there is a data breach, you have to be the one to announce it to your customers and you have to not use our name because none of these car washes used the name of whoever this third party payment processor was that lost the data. So when you are involved in negotiating contracts at your company to the extent you get to be involved, I hope you are, um, this is something you need to look out for. Who is going to be making the data breach announcements and how are they going to be making them? Or if you're evaluating different vendors, you might want to pick the one that's not going to make you publicly announce that you lost the credit card information that they actually lost. Um, looking at some of these other breaches, uh, you notice a lot of medical names on there. Um, small medical groups are very target, are rich targets right now because they don't have a lot of resources to prevent a breach, but they have a lot of information that people would like to have. Um, very personal information that can be used in a lot of different ways. Um, let's see. Oh, and the Metropolitan Urology Group is particularly interesting. They had a problem with ransomware, which is getting to be a bigger and bigger problem these days. Um, let's see. And this just goes back to the problems with everybody using the same service provider. So I'll give you a minute to read. But to be perfectly honest, I really just wanted an excuse to let you all see an XKCD comic in the middle of my presentation, so. All right. Okay, so when you have a data breach, you get a warning. Something is wrong. You're seeing unusual file movements. You're seeing pings on your firewall, not really pings on your firewall. I just said that because 
somebody was complaining to me about not having any sort of systematic response in their company. And they're saying, well, the, the CEO wants to be informed of everything. Am I supposed to tell them about every ping on our firewall? So I thought you might find that funny. OK, so <laughs> when you first notice a, play, a problem, it's going to be unclear what the problem is. But you know, since this is really important, of course, you already have a plan in place to cover it, right? Raise your hand if you already have a plan in place to cover it. Mm, not nearly as many people as I was expecting to see. Um, about four-fifths of companies have a data breach response plan as of 2015, according to Experian. Now, how many of you are confident that the plan you have in place is going to work? I see one hand, two, two hands in the room. Only about a third of companies are confident that the plan that they have in place will work. Now, having a plan is not just a good idea. It's actually the law if you have any information from people who live in Massachusetts. I'm not aware of any other states that actually have anything as comprehensive as Massachusetts requirements. Um, but what they require you to have is a comprehensive information security plan. You have to develop it. You have to implement it. You have to maintain it. And it has to have administrative, technical, and physical safeguards. And it has to be understandable to just you know regular guy on the street. And having data on a single Massachusetts resident triggers this requirement. So unless you are completely confident that nobody who lives in Boston has ever used your services, you should have a plan. So let's say you do have a plan, but you're not very confident in it, or you don't have a plan. What do you do? You don't panic, because now we're going to stop talk through the steps that should be in your plan. All right. Um, so this is who needs to be involved in the creation of your plan and its implementation if you already have one. You need to have security, technology, legal, customer service, and PR or communications, whoever you've got in your company. Um, depending on the size of your company, these might be the same two people. They might be 20 different people. It's hard to say. Um, but if you do have a plan and it doesn't include the roles and responsibilities of all of these different departments, you need to go back and update your plan. Um, as a quick aside, this picture here, I was uh, Google searching through the Creative Commons for diverse business meeting. And literally half of the photos that came up had Vladimir Putin in them. It's the weirdest thing. I don't understand. All right, so. We're going to talk about the things that your plan should cover. And we're going to come back to these sort of marking your spot slides every now and then. And whatever's in yellow is the next thing I'm going to talk about. So right now, I'm going to talk about steps to follow. And the first step to follow is escalation. It is concurrent with the next step to follow, which is investigation. So here are the people you need to think about what point in time am I going to contact these people, your chief information officer and your lawyers. Depending on the size of your company, the chief information officer and your main internal or, out or external counsel might be two of the first people you contact. Um, you know, if we're, if we're talking about a 3M, they're going to be, you know, the general counsel and the chief information officer and the CEO are going to be very late in the process. You're not going to contact them until you find out Russia hacked you, right? Um, but you need to know when you will contact them. Um, that's one of the things that you have to have in the plan is what are the triggering events? At what point in time is it worth waking up the CEO at 2 in the morning? 
Uh, if you've got your employee who stole the 1600 social security numbers, yeah, that's a big deal, but it's not a wake up the CEO at two in the morning big deal. If you have Russian hackers infiltrating your systems, that's probably a wake up the CEO at two in the morning kind of big deal. Um, for external contacts, uh, your data forensics consultant is going to be one of the first people you want to contact. Do we have any data forensics consultants in the room? We got a couple. So are, are you guys the first people that should be contacted? They're nodding, yes. Um, and part of the reason for that is that they're going to help you not destroy evidence. That's one of the most important things that you can do is make sure you're keeping very good records of what you have done and what happened before you started doing it. All right, so the next interlocked step, which I've sort of started talking about a little bit already, right, is investigation. Um, so bring in the cavalry, that's that external data forensics consultant. Um, if you can afford it, you probably want to bring in outside help in all of those areas I was talking about, outside legal help, outside consulting help, outside PR help, um, just because in these situations, or you don't want to bring them in in every situation, but you want to have a list of people who you can go to if the situation demands it, um, and already have those relationships in place. Um, so again, don't destroy evidence. Have people on hand who can help you make sure that you don't destroy evidence. Um, not only is the evidence important if there is any kind of law enforcement going on with this, but it's also important if you get sued over what happened later. You want to be able to show that you did everything right, or at least show that you did as many things as you could right. Um, you want to notify law enforcement. Who exactly that is is going to depend on what happened and what your company is. So again, that is the whole triggering events element of the plan. And you want to make sure that you're asking the right questions. What specifically was compromised? What can we do to prevent further damage? Can this system be quarantined? What data can be salvaged? What data can we still trust? Uh, can we figure out who did it? That might be more of law enforcement's problem, but it might help you figure out how you're going to react to it. And then there is the big legal question, which is, is it a data breach as defined by law? Um, there can be breaches of your system that are very important to you as a company, like someone gets hold of your trade secrets. You don't have to tell, um, well, you may have to tell some people that. You don't have to tell your customers about it. Um, the data breaches that get a lot of attention in the media tend to be the ones where people's social security numbers and credit card numbers are stolen. Um, so it's important that someone in your company know the applicable laws. Um, one question that I get all the time is, is there a strictest law that we can just comply with and not worry about the 50 different state laws and several different laws of U.S. protectorates and so on? Um, and unfortunately, the answer to that is no. There is no strictest law. There are just different requirements. Some states include biometric data if you lose biometric data. Some states include genetic data. Some don't. So if your breach includes people from you know, a state that doesn't include genetic data and you're 23 and me, you don't have to tell them that you lost their genetic information. Um, Let's see, Massachusetts and California are ones that you should be aware of because Massachusetts is the one that requires the plan and California just has um, very active enforcement. Although, interestingly, the attorney general who was in charge of enforcement in California, Kamala Harris, 
is now one of the state senators for California. So one of the things that we might see out of that, and fingers crossed, is federal legislation that covers this stuff so that we can supersede this patchwork of 50 different laws to comply with. Um, that's what happened with can spam back in the early 2000s. There were all these state laws coming out, and then the federal government said, hey, this is silly. Let's just have one rule. Um, that would make your jobs much, much easier if we just had one law. Okay, so what is a data breach then if it you know, varies so much? It's generally the unauthorized acquisition of computerized data that compromises the security, confidentiality, or integrity of personal information maintained by a data collector. Um, so I underlined some of the important words there. Unauthorized means that if it was an authorized person, it's not a data breach. Unless they use it in a way they shouldn't. That AT&T employee who you know, took the 1,600 social security numbers for personal gain, that was not authorized. Um, computerized data is underlined because that is not a consistent requirement. Um, most of the state laws deal only with computerized data, but there's a handful that just say data. So um, you'll occasionally hear about things where, um, I'm not going to say the name of the company because I'm not entirely sure which one it was off the top of my head, but a shoe store dumped a bunch of printed records into a, um, a garbage can outside back and it had full credit card numbers printed out on it. And this was several years ago now. It wasn't actually a violation of the state's data breach law. It wound up that the FTC enforced it as a violation of um, unfair competition laws at the federal level. But it wasn't a violation of the state's data breach law because the state didn't include paper records. Um, personal information I'm going to come back to. And then data collector, I underline because I want to drive home again that point about contracts and how important it is that you make sure that your third party data collectors where you know, you're the little tiny car wash and you never actually see a credit card number, don't foist the obligations back on you because by contract in most states, you can foist the obligations on someone else. So moving back to personal information. This is a non-complete list of the types of personal information that tend to be included in these laws. So as information security professionals, these are the kinds of information that you want to make sure are very well protected because one of the other elements of the state data breach laws in most but not all states is that if this information is encrypted or redacted or otherwise technologically secured and the bad guys get in and get the information but they don't know how to unencrypt it you know they don't have they didn't get your key for unencrypting it or unredacting it or otherwise technologically freeing it it's not a breach you don't have to do all of the um, informing people steps of what happened. Um, and Iowa is one of those states that does not require, if, if it's in encrypted form, Iowa does not require that you do the data breach notification. So this is really the main legal obligation point is the, oh, we have a question. I don't really need the mic. I got, everyone can hear me? Hey, on the last slide, you didn't have anything about like uh, usernames and passwords, like credentialing or authentication information. Is that not a legal reporting? Uh... It probably is in a few states. Um, I couldn't tell you which ones. If I had to guess, I would guess California. Um, <laughs> well, it causes cancer too. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so. Uh, that was just a general list of the kinds of things. I mean, if I had to give broad categories of what those requirements are, it's going to be contact information, 
sensitive financial numbers and health-related information is usually going to be subject to the data breach laws. But, you know, I, I can't give anything specific in this context. Okay. So responses and reporting. This is the part where all those laws are making you go out and do something. And I mentioned reporting several times. Um, it's going to be in the form of, um, oh wait, we don't want to stop yet, sorry. Um, it's going to be in the form of sending letters to people um, or contacting the media or um, sending emails to people who were affected by a breach. Now we want to stop. Before you do reporting, you need to check two things. The first one is those contracts. Make sure that it's not someone else's obligation to report based on your company's contracts. The second one is law enforcement. You remember we already contacted law enforcement way back when we were doing the investigation and escalation step. Well, if law enforcement tells you, I don't want you to contact the victims yet because I'm still figuring out what happened on my end and I think I can catch the bad guys, you do what law enforcement tells you. Just about every law has an exception to its required time frame for the notifications for the needs of law enforcement. Um, when these laws were first starting to come out, everybody said within 45 days. But, you know, not if law enforcement says not to. Then everybody said 30 days. And now everybody says as expeditiously as possible, but consistent with the needs of law enforcement. I wouldn't push that um, <laughs> past 30 or 45 days if you can at all avoid it. Because you don't want to be the company who has the test case case of what exactly does as expeditiously as possible mean? You don't want to be the guy who's like, oh, I thought six months was fine, right? No. All right. So the steps to follow responses reporting. You've got required reporting and non-required reporting. Um, we've talked about law enforcement. Uh, if you're a public company, you might have to tell your investors. Um, you should talk to your lawyer about whether a breach is significant enough to trigger an 8K report. Um, depending on the size of the breach and the state, you may have to tell the state attorney general of the state where your customers reside. Um, you may have to tell regulators if you're in a regulated industry you may have to tell credit reporting agencies, depending on the state. Um, you might have to report to the media if you don't have contact information for your customers. Or again, depending on the state. Some states make you fall on your sword no matter what. Um, and then you do have to tell your affected customers in every state. Um, there are also some excuse me, some communications that are not required but are just a good idea. Um, you want to tell your employees before they find out from the media or from someone else. Um, if you're a non-public company, you may not be required to tell your investors. You may be required. You should consult with a lawyer who does that particular type of law. Um, but you want to tell them anyway because you don't want them coming to you and saying, hey, why am I hearing about this in the paper? Um, and then you may want to have media statements prepared that are beyond what is legally required because sometimes the media finds out about things while you're right in the middle of figuring out what the heck happened. And you want to have something that's a little more reassuring than no comment. Um, so in view of that, you should have these statements prepared ahead of time. You want to have breach letter templates for your customers, credit reporting agencies, and any required media statements. Um, you want to have an idea of what you're going to tell any regulators that you need to inform, um, and your investors and employees. You want to have those template non-required media statements. 
Um, the other things that you might want to consider is, because these are going to be really fact specific, you probably can't have prepared templates for these, but you might want to have on hand a list of the kinds of things that you're going to need to let your insurer know about and let in law enforcement know about. Um, so what you need to, oh, yeah. Okay, so the question is, how do you prevent losing control of the situation when you bring in law enforcement? And um, I, my answer is, you really shouldn't try not try to, because if you do anything that they consider to be interference with their investigation, you've just brought a whole new level of trouble on your company. Um, when you are contacting law enforcement, you want to be smart about which law enforcement you're contacting. You don't want to just call the local police no matter what happened. Um, you might want to have a list of contacts who you've already got a relationship with, um, which actually is something I'm covering a little later. Um, which, uh, like, so the, the local FBI agent in charge of cyber crimes, you want to call that person up, say hi, introduce yourself, and make sure that you've got a relationship before something happens. Um, I hear the guy we had in Iowa is leaving. He got promoted. Good for him. So if you already have that contact, be ready to refresh it. Okay, so um, the kinds of things that you need to include in these uh, breach reports. Um, this is specific to the reports that you're sending to your customers who are affected. You want to talk about what you know, how it happened, what information was taken, and how the thieves have used the information if you already know that. Um, you want to tell them what remedial actions you're taking. So how are you going to make sure this doesn't happen to them again? Why should they keep trusting you with their information? Um, you want to talk about protective actions that your company is taking to fix what happened. Um, and also what your victims can do. There's a great website that you can d um, send people to. It's identitytheft.gov, and it will always have current information about steps people can take to protect themselves after a data breach. Um, you want to have contact information that, where people can contact people in your organization who can answer any questions that they have. Um, I was talking to someone last night who had had a data, data breach at their organization, and he told me that they sent out their letters and, you know, they were all ready to answer any questions, and one person called. And that one person had one question, and after they answered the question, the person said, oh, whatever. So you may not have a lot to do if there's a data breach, but you should be ready to answer questions. Um, then you want to make sure that the letter includes how you will contact them in the future to prevent re-victimization by someone who comes in posing as you because they heard about this big data breach and they're thinking, oh, I can get these people to tell me something on the phone if I call them. Um, and you also want to include any additional information that is required by law. Um, since we're in Iowa, I included that Iowa also requires this letter to include advice to the consumer to report su suspected incidents of identity theft to local law enforcement or the attorney general, which is not a big deal to include, but you're going to be in trouble if you don't include it. Um, so tips for these communications, which you should all be involved in writing. It's really important that you folks be involved in writing these communications because you get to be the ones who fill in the blanks in these letters and you might be the ones who have to answer questions when the phone calls come in. So these communications need to be honest. Um, 
don't lie. If you have to omit information, it should be because law enforcement told you to omit the information because of their ongoing investigation. Um, it should give information to consumers about how they can protect themselves. And you don't give information again that might put them at further risk. You consult with law enforcement on that one. Um, <clears throat> When you're doing these letters, I'd just like to point out, might be a good time to pitch projects that you've been wanting to get done at your company because one of the things you're gonna wanna do is be involved in deciding which kinds of letters you should be prepared to send. Which uh, kinds of breaches do you think your system is most vulnerable to? And that might be the time to say, you know, hey, we could fix this if you give me budget for next year, and then we won't have to send this letter, right? Um, the other thing that these letters need to do is anticipate what the questions will be and answer them in advance. Um, I've seen a lot of them that are just in FAQ format, and that works really well for people. All right, so our next step in our plan is remediation. Um, so one of the things you need to make sure that you do is if the information that was breached winds up on websites, make sure you get it taken down and make sure you include any cached information in search engines. Um, you should be in a position to make sure that the same kind of hack never happens twice. So when you bring in those outside consultants, after all of the excitement is done, they're gonna have recommendations for you to make sure that this does not happen again. You need to follow the remedial steps that are in the forensic report. It might be training, it might be, hey, this idiot clicked on a link and it brought down your whole system for a day. You need to make sure your employees know not to click on those kinds of links. Um, it might be that you need some new software. I was doing a, a walkthrough the other day that involved a foreign state actor getting into a bank system because they were too cheap to buy outside software. I don't know if this is based on a real situation or not, big disclaimer. Um, but they had done their own homegrown encryption. And it wasn't as good as the commercial, right, I know. <laughs> It wasn't as good as commercially available software, so their remediation was go pay people who know what they're doing next time. Um, it might be new hardware. It's possible that somebody just walked right into your hardware location and got in that way, and you should make sure you have hardware that isn't susceptible to that, and also locks on the doors. Locks on the doors are good. Um, you may need to tell your service providers that they need to make some changes, and you may need new service providers. You may say, look, we just can't trust this third-party payment provider anymore with our car wash, and we're just going to find somebody who's not going to make us fall on our swords next time. Um, the other thing you need to think about from the information security perspective is to see if your network segmentation worked the way it should. Um, don't ask me any questions about that, that's you guys. Okay, so the final steps are reevaluation and practice. Um, after you have had a breach, you need to go back and look at your plan again and say, did this work? Did it do what it was supposed to do? What can we do better next time? Because there's gonna be a next time, it's not if, it's when. Um, and then you need to practice the plan periodically. Uh, this practice sessions might be scheduled or unscheduled. Um, you may actually have obligations, especially in regulated industries, to have these unscheduled drills. Um, and your regulators, if you're in a regulated industry, are usually willing to run these drills with you. I have heard, but not actually confirmed, that you know when you build that relationship with the FBI agent, the FBI agent is gonna be willing to run through with you as well. Um, they may want the scheduled ones, though. Wouldn't blame them. Okay, so now we have walked through the steps that you should follow in your plan. Now we're gonna talk about, there's a few appendices that your plan should have, and we're gonna talk about what should be in those appendices. Um, the first one is the regulatory requirements and contacts. If you are in a regulated industry, you, you are aware of it. 
and you know that if there's a breach of HIPAA information, there's certain people you gotta tell about it. Make sure all of their contact information is in your appendix and make sure it's regularly updated when you hear, oh, by the way, this person has moved on. Or that you've got maybe a website where you know that you will be able to find the current contact information every time. Um, same with the financial industry. There's a lot of regulations and, and they will involve contacting people. Um, if your company is included in those critical infrastructure regulations that were promulgated under the Obama administration, there may be specific people that you need to contact when something goes wrong. Their contact information should be in there. Um, state data breach laws, I mentioned that you might have to talk to the Attorney General, but different states have different requirements. Um, I was actually one of them. We have. No, I'm sorry, Massachusetts I'm thinking of, never mind. So in Massachusetts, there is a subdivision of the governor's office that you have to contact to let know of a breach in addition to the attorney general. Um, social security number laws, I haven't talked about very much, but there are special requirements for how you treat social security numbers, and of course, there are 50 of them, and of course, they sometimes conflict with one another. You know, unlike the data breach laws, which may just have different requirements, there are actual requirements in some of the social security number laws that say you have to redact this part in this state, but the other part in a different state. It's very frustrating. Um, but those may also have contacts. You may have to contact specific people in specific states in the event of a social security number breach. And then the FTC. Um, this one is, Generally, you're going to know already if the FTC uh, needs to be informed because you're probably already in trouble. Um, but if they need to be informed, you need to make sure you know who to call. Uh, and again, all of these contacts, there's going to be triggers for contacting them. Make sure you don't just call everybody right at the start. Don't just flip to the back and start making phone calls because you don't know what happened. Um, and that's panic mode. We don't want to panic. Um, and you might be telling people things that you didn't need to tell them and cause even more trouble for your company. So make sure that it's really clear what those triggering events are in your plan for contacting these people. Um, I'm skipping over prepared statements because we talked about that in the responses and reporting section. But um, business continuity plans should be in your appendix. Um, there's two different kinds of business continuity plans. There's your regular plan, which you should have in place just because it's a really good idea to have one, and then you need to have a special data breach plan. It is possible that your regular plan already covers the kinds of things that you need to have in a data breach plan, so your appendix might just say, go back to the bookshelf and get a copy of our business continuity plan. Um, but the, the kinds of things that you need to be able to do is figure out how to keep your company running while you're taking the steps to quarantine evidence, or quarantine affected systems and maintain evidence, not destroy evidence. Um, so if your regular plan doesn't already address that, make sure that you have something specific in your data breach plan about what you're gonna do. Uh, then there's a few things the plan just doesn't cover because it shouldn't. Um, these are the things that are legal actions that you might face after a breach. And these are the parts that are why it's so important that you not inadvertently destroy evidence um, and that you keep good records while you are addressing the data breach. Um, you might face regulator actions if you're in a regulated industry. Um, the attorney general may take enforcement action against you for the breach after you inform them that you had the breach. You have to tell them, but you might be subject to fines after that. Uh, you may face class action lawsuits. Um, that one is actually probably the easiest one to deal with because you can just have something in your customer agreements that says you can't do a class action lawsuit. Everything is subject to individual arbitration. But if it's not in there, you might be subject to a class action lawsuit. And then the fines can come from either the regulators or the state attorneys general. Um, so the things I want you to take away from this presentation, it will happen to you. You will have to deal with this at some point in your career. When it does, don't panic. 
If you don't have a plan, go back to work and make one on Monday. Gather all those people up and get going on it. Uh, if you do have a plan, especially if you were one of the people who did not raise your hand and say, I am confident that it will work, go practice it on Monday. Uh, schedule a drill or figure out when you're going to do an unscheduled drill. Um, and the last thing is you can't do this on your own. The, all those departments need to be involved for a reason. So don't try to do it on your own. Use your internal and external resources. They are there for a reason. And now, does anyone have any questions? Do you want? Yeah. Okay, so um, there's usually not a requirement. I, I don't think I've ever seen one that says it's not a breach if you, know, you have fewer than 50 people affected. Um, what it's going to say, though, is you have to notify the individuals who are affected, but where you're going to have more things kick in is like maybe you don't have to tell the attorney general until there are 500 residents of this state affected. Um, maybe there's a necessity for a public announcement to the media if you have more than 500 individuals in the state affected. Um, but you are, you know, it's still a breach and you have to tell the person who was affected if there is some kind of breach. Um, so, I've actually worked on a breach where there was a single person affected and it wasn't anything nefarious. It was just people had really stupid passwords and someone got into the wrong person's account um, and could see their social security number from there, which if you can avoid it, just don't collect those. If there is any way that you, your company can avoid having social security numbers, it's really better not to have them. Anyway. <laughs> Um, that one individual had to be informed, had to go through the whole process, um, but there wasn't, you know, there wasn't attorney general notification because it was just one person and it wasn't, you know, scary breach. Okay, cool. So it sounds like the quantity of the records really varies state by state. You gotta you yep. gotta seek out, you know, obviously legal counsel specific to that circumstances. The common question I get asked a lot is how many, you know, how many counselors Second thing, um, and, and this is a highly debated question as well, is um, when does that ticker start? You mentioned 30 days, sometimes 45 days. It's, it, that's a nebulous target to begin with. But um, some conversations of debate is when does that ticker start? Is it the moment that your forensics team discovered the loss? Or was it when the loss occurred eight months ago when the data actually went out the front door? Because obviously, average detection time in a lot of organizations is months and months and months after mm -hmm. the data is lost. So, the common question I hear is, when does that 30 to 45 day ticker start? Is it at the time of loss or at the time of detection? And I'm curious what, what you've run into uh, in the industry from a legal standpoint. It's generally from the time of detection. Um, you can't tell people what you don't know about. Mm -hmm. So. Um, they should have done this before. Um, <laughs> you know, you might have your 
you know, your local guy who set up your business for you and has been doing this for 30 years, but he's never done a data breach plan, you want to ask him for a referral. That's another thing you should always look for an attorney is if you have a referral to that person. Um, if you've got people you trust who also trust the attorney, that's a good attorney to go to. Um, you want to look for someone who is going to be available when the breach happens. You know, if, if you need to call them at two in the morning, they'll, they need to be there at two in the morning. Um, hopefully that never happens for all involved, but it could. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's the main thing is that they they need to know what they're doing. You know, if they if they start talking about, oh, we're only going to comply with the laws of Iowa because you're in Iowa, walk out the door. Um, so the, the question was basically how do you decide whose laws apply and all of these data breach laws apply based on where the residency is of the person affected. So you might be organized in Delaware and operating in Iowa and have offices in Massachusetts and none of that matters because if the person affected is in Alaska you're following Alaska's law. Um, generally, the international laws are also based on the residence of the person affected, but they're less concerned with data breach than they are with making sure things stay private in the first place as a general rule. Are you aware of any uh, legal requirements for unintentional data exposure? So the example being, you sent an email with an attachment that went to the wrong place. And so are there any context for legal requirements other than saying, hey, I sent you an email on a state, please destroy and disregard what was sent? Yep. Um, so when we were looking at that definition way back, the general definition of a data breach Okay, I'm not going to go all the way back. That's too far. Um, but the general definition of a data breach is unauthorized access. It doesn't matter whether the unauthorized access is by somebody, you know, Russian hackers or because someone sent the attachment to the wrong person. Um, it is unauthorized access. Now, one of the ways that you can prevent that is if you're emailing the kinds of sensitive information that might trigger a data breach notification is to encrypt the attachment and send the password separately, right? Because then they have the information but not the key, right? Just a Thanks. tip. Any other questions? All right. Well, then you have a short break before the next person, I yeah. think.